in two weeks, not next Sunday, but the next Sunday, we're going to do baptism. And I want to talk to you a little bit about baptism and what it represents. It'll be, we're going to come here on June the 4th, that morning, and we're going to do worship as usual right here. And uh, when we finish, whatever time that is, we'll go to Swiss Pine Lake. It's already reserved for us. We're going to go there, and we're going to have a church picnic, and we're going to have baptism. But I want to talk just for a second and share what I thought the Lord has been doing this morning and what he's been telling us and what he's showing us. We observe two ordinances here at the ark, which are baptism and the Lord's Supper or communion. An ordinance is, by definition, a practice or a ceremony or a prescribed usage. So when you hear ordinances in the church, that's what it's talking about. It's really, it's a prescribed usage or a ceremony or a practice that we observe. And again, we observe baptism and we observe communion. So I want to look real quickly because I, I, I want to make sure that everything that we do lines up biblically, that we're not doing things just because it's been passed down by, by man or this is what man says for us to do, but we want to do what the Lord tells us to do. Jesus said in Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19, you don't have to turn there unless you just want to, this is Jesus' words. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And again, Jesus said in Mark sixteen sixteen, he says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. So who should be baptized? All born-again believers who have, been re who have repented of their sins should be baptized. Acts 2.38, Peter says, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When we are baptized, we follow the example of Jesus and we fulfill all righteousness. Matthew three thirteen through 15 says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you and you are coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And I believe if Jesus found it was necessary to fulfill all righteousness, being the perfect and spotless Lamb of God, then how much more should we? When we are baptized, we are obedient to Christ's command. And again, in Matthew 28, 19, Jesus said, Go and make disciples and baptize them. So we're being obedient when we baptize and when we are baptized. Baptism also represents our willingness to be identified with Christ. <clears throat> Acts chapter 8, verses 36 through 38. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. So what hinders me from being baptized? In verse 37, then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. See, it's not in just that you got to believe. you got to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Verse 38, so he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. And what does baptize, baptism mean? This is one you may want to turn because it's a little bit long. Look, look at Romans 6. <clears throat> Romans chapter 6. I'm going to read verses um, 1 through 14. So what does it mean to be baptized? What does it represent? Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1. 
What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died in sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized, as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we should also live with him. <clears throat> Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its, in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments or tools of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instrument of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. You know, I was reminded even in that, that in the beginning we were given dominion. So sin should not have dominion over us. We should have dominion over, Christ, over sin. So when you are baptized, it signifies death and resurrection. It signifies as you are laid down and immersed into the water, it, it, it signifies the laying down and the dying to your own life. And then as you are being raised up, the resurrection into new life. Contrary to what some teach, baptism does not bring about salvation and should not happen until salvation has already happened. The word baptize comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to bury. Therefore, we believe to be baptized, you are immersed in water, signifying that the old man is being buried and the new man is being res resurrected as you are being lifted up out of the water. Now, this is the point that I want to share with you right now. That is the biblical <clears throat> reference and meaning of baptism. And we understand that if we are born again, if we've been saved, that we are to be baptized. But I want to share with you again, just to help us get it. It helps me just see from not such a, I don't know, and I know this is, not the right words, but from a church or religious perspective, the love of God and what he's looking for and what he's asking for his bride to be. And again, I go back to the Jewish wedding at the time of Jesus. This was the traditional Jewish wedding at the time of Jesus. At, the, at this time when a groom, a bridegroom, selected or found this bride to be that he wanted to propose to he first had to go to her father and ask her hand in marriage and also negotiate a price that he was willing to pay for his bride to be this price was a significant cost because it it not only reimbursed the family for all the expenses they had incur, incurred for raising up this daughter this bride to be, but also supplement or paid for the expenses that they would encounter to prepare her for the wedding. All the bridesmaids that would attend her, all the dresses, all the perfumes, all the things, whatever it took to make her ready. So this was a significant cost. And when you look at it from God's perspective, Jesus 
paid a huge price for his bride to be. He willing, the cost that was demanded for Jesus, for you and for me, was his life. He willingly laid his life down and surrendered his own natural life to pay the price that we could become his bride. So he paid the price. So once this price was negotiated and agreed upon, then the groom-to-be would prepare this written covenant. We have a new covenant that has been prepared for us. In this covenant contract agreement, this was a legally binding contract that this this was not a religious thing. This was a government. This is a natural thing that the that the uh, this is how a wedding and how this worked. So they they prepared this contract that was that spelled out all that it spelled out what the price was to be. It spelled out what the what she could expect what the conditions were of the marriage, what, what all the things that the gifts that were going to be presented to her, all the things, all the, you know, it, it was a legally binding contract. He would come and sit across the table from his pride to be, and he would pour a glass of wine and set it in between them. He would present her with this contract, with this covenant, and she would begin to read it. This was serious because it didn't like, it wasn't like if this thing don't work out, we just get a divorce. This was a legal binding contract. It was a covenant that they were entering into. So she studied this document very carefully, which we should know, we should understand before we make a decision to commit our life totally to the Lord, we should know what we're getting into. He says to consider the cost. There is a price you pay. You have to be willing to give up your life for his life. So she would study this contract. If she was in agreement, she would take the cup and drink the wine. Representing the blood covenant that they were entering into. It was the seal of the contract saying, yes, I agree. At this point, the groom would go back to his father's house to prepare a place for his bride to come. He would go and, and add on to the house, the father's house, build a room. He did not know when he was coming back to get his bride, neither did the bride know when he was coming back. And tradition was that uh, only, only the father could tell the son when he was ready to go get the bride. And we know that even Jesus says that, that Jesus doesn't even know the time or the hour that he's coming back. Only the father knows. The bride, the church, doesn't know when he's coming either. Only the father knows. And so the tradition was that, that he would, when the father said, it's time, you can call, go get your bride, the tradition was that they would typically come in the middle of the night because they wanted to surprise her and they wanted it to be a big to-do. and They would bring all his friends and all the family and they'd come riding into the town or, and they would be blowing trumpets. And, 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 and during all this time, the, the, the bride would have these bridemaids that were on alert all the time, ready, listening, waiting to make sure they could get her up, get her dressed, have her ready to go, that she was attended to and ready to run out and meet her bride, groom. But the thing that happened when he went to prepare the place, the bride then went and took this bath with all these perfumes and fragrances and uh, that was poured into this. And it was this long procedure of a, of a bath that was in preparation for her groom. This bath was called baptism. It was washing away all the past. It was preparing herself for the, her future with him. It was, a, it, was, it was signifying that she is set apart now. She no longer is, is, is in the past or in her, the, the world, that she's not for any other one. She is prepared and set apart only for him. 
she has committed. They are legally right now, even before they've consummated the wedding, they are legally bound and married at this point because they've entered into covenant. So this baptism signifies the preparation for your bridegroom, the commitment that you are making, the washing away of the past, the setting aside of the old man and becoming, being raised up again, afresh and anew as a new person. I want to read, read you something from the Song of Songs, from the Passion Translation, and it's from chapter 4 in the Song of Psalms, starting in verse 6, and it goes through chapter 5, verse 1. But this, this conversation that's going on between the bride-to-be and the bridegroom-to-be. And we understand, you know, that this is like written as King Solomon to his bride, to the Shulamite bride. But the bride represents the church, represents us. And the groom represents Christ, our bridegroom. So the broad says, finally, after a lot of stuff has gone on, I've made up my mind. Until the darkness disappear and the dawn has fully come, in spite of all the shadows and fears, I will go to the mountaintop with you, the mountain of suffering love and the hill of burning incense. Yes, I will be your broad. Sometimes we just got to make a decision. We got to just say, you know what? Yes, I will do it. Then the bridegroom responds, every part of you is so beautiful, my darling. Perfect, your beauty without flaw within. Now you are ready, bride of the mountains, to come with me as we climb the eyes peaks together. Come with me through the archway of trust. We will look down from the crest of the glistening mounds and from the summit of our sublime sanctuary. Together we will wage war in the lion's den and in the leopard's lyre as they watch nightly for their prey. For you reach into my heart with one flash of your eyes. I am undone by your love, my beloved, my equal, my bride. You leave me breathless. I am overcome by merely a glance from your worshiping eyes, for you have stolen my heart. I am hostage for your love and by the grace of righteousness shining upon you. I think this was what was happening this morning. He was looking down and seeing this beautiful bride in our worshiping eyes that had stolen his heart. And then verse 10, it goes on to say, how satisfying to me my equal, my bride. Your love is my finest wine, intoxicating and thrilling. And your sweet prefer perfume praises, they're so exotic and so pleasing. Your loving words are like a honeycomb to me. Your tongue releases milk and honey, for I, have, for I find that promised land flowing within you. The fragrance of your worship and love surrounds you with scented robes of white, my darling bride, my private paradise, fastened to my heart. A secret spa, spring are you that no one else can have. My bubbling fountain hidden from public view. What a perfect partner to me now that I have you. Your inward life is now sprouting, bringing forth fruit. What a, power, what a beautiful paradise unfolds within you. When I'm near you, I smell aromas of the finest spice for many clusters of my exquisite fruit now grow within your inner garden. Here are the nine, pomegranates of passion, henna from heaven, spikenard so sweet, saffron shining, fragrant calamus from the cross, sacred cinnamon and branches of scented woods, myrrh like tears from a tree and alloy as eagles ascending. Your life flows into mine, pure as a garden spring. A well of living water springs up from within you like a mountain brook flowing into my heart. And then the bride responds, Then may your awakening breath blow upon my life until I am fully yours. Breathe upon me with your spirit wind. Stir up the sweet spice of your life within me. 
Spare nothing as you make me your fruitful garden. Hold nothing back until I release your fragrance. Come walk with me as you walked with Adam in your paradise garden. Come taste the fruits of your life in me. And the king responds, I have come to you, my darling bride, for you are my paradise garden. And the bride responds, come walk with me until I'm fully yours. Come taste the fruit of your life in me. What a picture of the relationship between the church and her God, her king, her bride to be, her bridegroom to be. 